Agreeing with you. Relax there, Arizona guy. All right, welcome to, welcome to the jump. I'm George Sedano, sitting in for our fearless leader, Rachel Nichols, today. And, of course, she's on assignment. I'm joined by a couple of NBA champs. You've heard one of them in Richard Jefferson. Of course, our man, Perk, Kendrick Perkins. Coming up later, Rachel sat down with Steve Nash ahead of the Nets' ABC Saturday primetime matchup with the Mavericks. They talked about the Nets' defense, the addition of James Harden, and much more. So stay tuned for that. But first, let's get to the Sixers, who remained ahead of the Nets by a half game in the top spot in the Eastern Conference after beating the Mavericks yesterday. Philly held Luka Doncic to 19 points with Ben Simmons serving as the primary defender. Here's what Simmons said after the game. My IQ, I feel like it's very high. Uh, I try to make the right plays every time down the court. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a mismatch nearly every time when, you, when I step on the floor. So you now I'm trying to make my teammates better. I'm trying to be the best point guard I can be. Um, and lead this team the right way. And then defensively, that's, I feel like that's just effort. Um, I do feel like I'm the best defensive player in the league. Um, you know, I can guard one through five. Simmons definitely put the clamps on Luka last night. And here are some of the numbers to prove it. Luka shot 33% when guarded by Simmons, compared to 57% from the field when guarded by anyone else, really. So, Richard, Simmons says he's the best defender in the league. You buying that? Well, look, I, I believe that he believes that 100%. And this is one thing that he said, name another player that typically can guard one through five. Maybe like Draymond Green, and because you understand there's a side difference with Ben Simmons, but also Draymond Green, Kawhi, there's probably about five or six guys that can do in the league what he does. And look, if he believes he's the best, I'm not going to argue with him. No, he is the best. And he should be the front runner for defensive player of the year. When you look at Ben Simmons, at 6'10", 250 pounds, physical specimen. He's fast. He knows how to use angles. He's great at shooting passing lane. Last night, he was on Luca Hills like a pair of socks, picking them up at the half court bar, <laughs> not and get fighting to get up over screens. He can't switch one through five. And look, he in my eyes right now, he is the best defensive player in the league, and he's the front runner for defensive player of the year. I don't know why RJ is making that face. But this is all facts. <laughs> I, I, I'm making the face because you said on his heels like a pair of socks. That was funny. I mean, that's that a good funny, analogy. Perk. That was a great analogy. I've heard a lot of country lingo in my day. <laughs> that one was a good one. <laughs> well, listen, our guy Hembo uh, at ESPN Research tweeted this out today. Luka Doncic, when guarded by Ben Simmons, according to Second Spectrum, 47 half-court matchups, 10 points, 3 assists, 4 turnovers. That's pretty good stuff, man, Richard. I don't think there's any question about that. No, there is no question. Look, I, I wasn't trying to make any arguments against Ben Simmons here in this point, but there's also guys that are very different, that have a different skill set, like a Rudy Gobert that have won it, like a Draymond Green. They're not built the same, but currently, right now, with where Philly stands and how he has played this year, I agree with Perk. He should be a front runner for defensive player of the year perk perk let me jump in here so who are the guys that you think can guard one through five obviously ben is one of them draymond is another one uh you know Kawhi. you mentioned i think it's it's certainly possible yeah. lebron at times has done that uh certainly throughout ben. his career bam out of bayou maybe another guy that uh, can do yep. that stuff there's not a lot of guys perk i mean you have anthony davis and right. maybe Giannis. yeah but when i look at ben the difference between ben and everyone else at that size is his ability to fight and get over screens. Like when he's he's going like when he was going Luca last night, it wasn't like he was switching pick and rolls. He was fighting to get up over screens. And you don't really see that out of a guy that's 6'10, 250 pounds. And the great thing about Ben, if he do get beat off the dribble, he is great at chase down blocks in the half court set. So so that's why I give the edge to Ben Simmons right now. And he look, he's taking pride in doing it. Yeah. This is not the first time that I've seen him do this. He's been doing this all season long. Yeah, that's That's why he's an all-star, and that's why he's one of the better players in the league. All right, let's move on. Nuggets Wizards last night. Denver was down two with 10 seconds to go. They had numbers on the fast break, but everyone so. decided to run to one side and all of them to the three-point line. Needless to say, not great spacing there. Denver failed to score and lost the game. So here's what Nuggets head coach Michael Malone and Jamal Murray said after the game. We had a layup. 
know, it's a three-on-one break. You know, all Michael Porter's got to do is cut to the basket. All Jamal Murray's got to do is push the ball and attack. But uh, we didn't get that. We got a Faku three, and obviously uh, uh, it, it didn't go in. Four and one, somebody should go to the rim. I thought Mike was going to the rim. He shot for three. He might have thought I was shooting it, and I, I should have shot it. I gave Faku a bad pass. Um, I think I, if I'm going to stop at the three, I got to shoot it. And if Mike's running the lane, you got to go to the rim, especially when there's other guys behind him. So I guess it's just a tough play where we uh, we didn't know we didn't know what we we're doing. We just got to score. Jamal Murray's tweet after the game speaks for itself. Clearly, not great spacing, not a great situation, as he alluded to. So, Perk, I got a couple of questions for you. Are you retweeting or deleting this from Murray? Do you like this particular approach from him? Okay, putting it on social media. And what do you think of the late game execution by the Nuggets? Well, well, first of all, I'm deleting it. I would have never tweeted it. You cannot throw your teammates under the bus. That's the first thing. And you're a leader. They're paying you $30 million a year. You're the robbing of the team. These are young guys. The guys that he put on this on, on his tweet uh, at that angle was a second uh, 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 Michael Porter Jr., who's a who's a young player in his second year. A guy that was an undrafted uh, rookie. Like you got to lead by example, and that's not the way to do it. Secondly. I see why RJ didn't work out in Denver because if they developing these type of habits and not uh, <laughs> having winning plays, knowing RJ being a champion, he would have slashed to the basket. Is this what they're teaching over there? Oh. Yes, it is because I blame the analysts, right? Because for the simple fact, teams are rehearsing this day in and day out in training camp and in practices. Hey, when you get out, run to the three-point line. It looked like they was allergic to running into the paint, and it's a shame. But, okay, so one, that's not the reason why I didn't work out in Denver. I was 200 years old when I was in Denver. <laughs> this is what I will say about this. I was this. giving yeah, you a compliment. I appreciate it, Perk, but look, he needs to delete this. You know why? Because Jamal Murray, the first 30 games of the season, really struggled. He really struggled. So to all of a sudden start throwing blame, and look, I don't think he was throwing blame when he first said it. They both said Michael Porter. Coach said it, and then Jamal Murray said Michael Porter. There's three people there, and you only heard Michael Porter's name. Now look, Monte Morris could have drove. Like, multiple people could have done different things. And my biggest thing about this is like, yes, you teach players to run to the corner, young players, but ultimately, Jamal Murray is one of the best young players in this league. He is one of the best guards in this league. If it wasn't for his slow start, he'd have an opportunity to be an all-star this year so i love jamal murray's game but part of that becomes mistakes and growth here to call them out on not him out but just the play on twitter and to say oh that's crazy well look there's other layers to that it's a young player jamal you really struggled the first 30 games of the season i don't see any of your teammates throwing out tweets like god i can't believe he missed this shot or man we need jamal murray to play better like these are things that you want to keep in house everyone's frustrated i think that was emotional jamal murray will be better but ultimately when you look at that that a lot has to do with the entire group. There were three people over there that should have gone in for a layup, that had an opportunity for a layup, and you know, you just gotta take it. But Jamal Murray's gotta be better. Like that's that's it's disappointing because I know that he is a great leader. I know that he is a great young player. And this, I think that tweet was just emotions. So Richard, let me ask you this, because you mentioned growth a lot there, and you mentioned how much you like Jamal Murray, and we all like Jamal Murray. What we saw in the bubble from him was incredible. Um, but doesn't the growth part also apply to his leadership abilities and styles, right? Like, this is the first time over the last year or so where it's really been his team as the vocal leader, right? Like, Jokic is the best player, but he is the vocal leader here. Yeah, yeah, but you don't have to be a vocal leader via Twitter, right? Like, that's not how you're a vocal leader. That's that's not it. Because ultimately, these things can cause little bitty tensions. Because what happens the next time you make a mistake and Michael Porter Jr. runs to Twitter and points out something? Then all of a sudden, it looks like, oh, well, you can't be talking to your star like that. Oh, you shouldn't do it. You got to set a precedence of like, hey, this way. I wasn't even a big fan of just saying, oh, well, Michael Porter Jr. should have gone. There were three people over there. Name all three. Because all three people are guilty for not running in for a layup. Anybody could have gone and got that layup. So to single out now, Michael Porter Jr. was the first one. That's why he was in the deep corner. So I kind of see your point, but ultimately there were multiple players there that could have gone and got the layup. So to call it out, to do these things, it doesn't help.
Well, I strong I strongly believe it, it, it it's in desperate need that they need some virtual learning over there on how to be leaders all across the board. Because <laughs> I'm gonna say this: just a couple weeks ago, Mike Malone in the post game interview, he said, "Hey." Jokic is balling. I need other guys to step up and give him some help. I thought he should have kept that in-house. That's something that you talk about behind closed doors. Usually if you're a coach, you come out and say, hey, our team just has to play better overall. You don't pinpoint and say, hey, one person is doing his job and others are not because you can pinpoint certain areas where Jokic is not as good on defense where he's getting blown by on pick and roll coverages. So at the end of the day, I think they need to come into Jesus meeting all across the board, including Mike Malone. All right, so growth across the board, perhaps, for everyone there in Denver, a learning experience. We'll, we'll see. All right. Coming up, Zion was asked about participating in the dunk contest on first take this morning with Stephen A., Max, and Molly. But he was non-committal. How badly do you want to see this happen? We'll get to that in a second. But first, it's time for our distant review. The well, look, he just did. Urban he just did that a week ago. This season is everything to me, uh, George. I don't care what RJ is talking about. I love how oh. much you guys are disagreeing today. This is a I good can't show. Stand That's what I'm we do. Really look All at right. that. That's what he's capable of doing. Don't tell me about that other dunk. How are you going to compare these two? You know what? RJ, variety is the spice of life, okay? You don't have to dunk it hard every day. You tell, time, that to your, all right? tell that to your wife? I do, actually, every day. <laughs> all right, next, make Serenity Now. Pels Bucks, Giannis drives in, gets it blocked by Steven Adams, but Adams just whistled for, the, whistled for the foul. So, Richard, are you impressed by his meditation tactics, though? Hey, look, I, Steven Adams was one of the more interesting men. Like, obviously, he was a backup for Aquaman. And then you saw the little, like, him trying to hop up. He gets the ball into the rack the first try every single time at the practice facility. He has so many great things about him. I'm not surprised that he has next-level serenity. Well, look, he was raised right. I, I raised Steven Adams, and I taught him how to keep his emotions under control. And that's why you saw him act the way he did. He saw me lose too much money while I was playing get technical fouls, and he decided to go the other way. He's cheap now. He's not giving up his money. All right, I was done meditating. Now to move on. Miss helping, Knicks Kings. Keep your eye on Marvin Bagley here. He provides a perfect lane for R.J. Barrett for the bucket. So... Perk, fill in the blank here. This defense by Bagley was blank. It was horrible. It was horrible. But, it, I mean, the Kings defense is horrible, period. I mean, one of the worst defensive uh, ratings ever in the history of the game. But this goes to show you that he don't care about defense. All Marvin Bagley cares about is getting the ball on the offensive end. And he thought he was on offense right here. It's contagious. He's playing offense on both ends of the floor. And sadly, Buddy Heald was actually there for his crackback. So you got, look, I, look, I feel for my guy, Coach Walton. I do feel for him because in this league, you got to win with talent. And they don't have a ton of veterans on that squad. Harrison Barnes is a veteran. All right, next. Love my guy. Make Bears back to Memphis. Check out the no-look lob from Ja to Brandon Clark. Richard, how often do you find yourself just tuning into the Grizzlies games to see Ja do this? Ja has only, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I really, be, I really believe that we're going to see first team all NBAs. We're going to see like uh, uh, MVP type seasons in, in the years. It might take five years, but Ja is going to be a force for a long time because he is just starting to get into his bag. I totally agree. Look, you know how high I am on Ja Morant. I feel like he's a combination of Russell Westbrook. Kyrie Irving and Ray John Rondo put into one. Okay, that's how high I am on John Moran. This doesn't surprise me one bit. It reminds me of when Jason Kidd used to make Richard look really good in New Jersey. Re right. Really good. All right. Second all-time in assist, and most of his assists are to me. <laughs> Time to run it back. The best no-look lobs ever. Number five, Steph to KD off the Draymond full-court pass. Look at this. Woo! Oh. Woo, I don't even remember that one. That one was gorgeous. Full court. He saw KD coming. Oh, the f Come on, man. 
Def has Woo. so much fun with the game. All right, next, my favorite one, number four, 2013 Christmas Day, LeBron from oh. D-Wade. I'm going to be really honest, though. People want to talk about Bron. That pass dunks itself. Kirk could dunk that pass right now. No, I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't dunk that it when I was playing RJ Nice for no. Did you? Oh, and that was Slim Braun. Yeah. Number three, Rudy Fernandez to Kenneth Fareed in 2012. It, it, but are you noticing the, the the lobs that they're that people are catching? When you have Kenneth Fareed, when you have LeBron James or KD, you can throw the ball anywhere. Right. Just get it up in the air. And then, of course, Jason Kidd to his oh, best New Jersey teammate, Kenyon Martin, in 2004. Oh, yeah, all two weeks they played together. It was amazing. <laughs> now, shout out my guy, Kmart. My big bro, Kmart, learned everything from him. <laughs> I'll tell Look you, that's that. what you call snatching the screws out your basket. And last one, number one, Lamar Odom to Darius Miles in 2012. Look at that! Woo! Good That's Lord. the best one. That's the best one. That's when Lob City really got kind of started, the swag of the Clippers. I know Blake Griffin and all those guys came years later, but this, to me, was like that original Lob kind of group. Yeah. I agree. Lamar Odom, one of the best passing bigs to ever play the game, oh. if you want to call him a big. Yeah, no, there's no doubt. Yeah, he is a big, but he, right, imagine him in today's game, uh, how impressive Lamar Ooh. Odom would be in today's game. Uh, speaking of alley -oops, Zion Williamson was on first take this morning, and of course, the topic of next month's dunk contest came up. Let's check it out. What's the deal? Are we going to see you in the dunk contest? Uh, I don't know yet. Uh, I don't know yet. Come on, your Zion. You're on first take. This is the time to announce it to America with Stephen A. Smith and Max Kellerman. We're going to see you, right? Who knows? Who knows? Still thinking about it. Uh. So you're saying there's a chance. All right, Richard, I'll start with you. How badly do you want to see Zion in the dunk contest? I think, I think randomly that Zion needs this dunk contest. I think when you look at what dunk contests do for athletes, whether it was Vince Carter, Michael Jordan, just going back in history, the dunk contest is a platform for everyone to see what you're capable of doing, your creativity. Now, we grew up, everybody grew up watching Zion, watching him on YouTube, but this is your moment. This is the, everyone has dunk contests, but there's only one NBA dunk contest. And so to be a part of that group, that would be something special. And I think he's got all of the tools. All right, Perk, so according to The Athletic, Obi Toppin, the high-flying Knicks rookie from Dayton, is expected to participate in the dunk contest. So, Perk, if Zion enters, this could be something special here, right? Oh, it will be something special. Look, this kid is so athletic, it's ridiculous. Every time I see him dunk or elevate, I get jealous instantly and ask God, why didn't he give me this type of athleticism? He's a high-flyer, and you know what? I'm all in for it because big man... In and in the dunk contest, they already gonna be behind the eight ball, and so Ob Toppin is just gonna shock the world. Yeah, I'm listen. I'm with you. I want to see it. Give me Zion. Give me Ob Toppin. Give me all these young men. Right to Richard's point earlier, and Perk, your point. This is a, a stage that you get if you're these if guys. Zion, if Zion doesn't do it, he's afraid. Oh. I'm gonna call it out. If he doesn't, oh, do it, he's you afraid. would say. You're not, He's not, hold on, Rich. Hold on, RJ. You I'm, call, I'm taking Toppin. I'm taking Toppin over him yeah, anyway, so it don't matter. Yeah, but but what I'm saying is you can't do that because you wouldn't dare call LeBron afraid. He never entered the slam. Go ahead, so RJ. Say it. Say it. Who? Say LeBron it. is 100. afraid he was 100 percent afraid ron didn't want oh. that he didn't want oh. that he didn't have he didn't oh. have that sexiness he ron didn't have all that <laughs> all right. ron didn't have all that sex LeBron, he was a game dunker lebron game dunker lebron you were called out by your former teammate richard jefferson that's all i'm gonna say all right two ladies 70 years old now Go coming ahead. up next on the jump steve nash has the brooklyn nets red hot and rolling eight straight wins is the first year head coach silencing some of his critics <coughs> kendrick perkins we break it down next with Rachel sit down with <laughs> better for sure um, somewhere between solid and, and and very good that's a project that 
you know, it, it, everyone realizes it could make or break our season. So that is something that we are cognizant of, that we talk about every single day and that we are moving in the right direction. But it's going to take the entire year for us to, to figure out how good we can be defensively. James Harden with a big three-pointer. Triple-double in his next debut. Welcome to Brooklyn. James Harden gets traded to Brooklyn. Could have gone a lot of different ways, Steve, but he came in really determined to be a facilitator. How has that unfolded from your perspective? It's been amazing. He's, in a sense, exactly what we needed. You know, he's a guy that is so gifted um, at reading the defense, manipulating the defense, distorting the defense, creating opportunities for his teammates. You know, a really true playmaker at a historic level. How much do you get the sense that your current players know about your playing career? They obviously know you're a Hall of Famer, but how much of a sense do you have that they actually watched you play or know about some of the details of your playing career? Well, I mean, th that's funny because some of them I played against, you know, um, Kevin, Jeff Green, DeAndre, you know, go down the line. The rest of them, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they know anything about. Uh, we've, I've never discussed it with them. Uh, I, I'm not even. I don't even know if they they know what teams I play for. When I think back to your career and moments I've covered, one of my favorite memories isn't as much a finesse moment, but the Western Semis in 2010. You got that bloody gash on your eye. What do you remember from that? You know, I think and I took an elbow and it was bleeding and I thought, okay, let's go get this stitched up and come back out. I did not know that by the time I got out, it'd be swollen shut. I don't know if you've ever done this, but gone to a park and shot with one eye closed. You start, <laughs> depth perception is a little off. So fortunately, I threw up a three, it went in and hung in there and, and my teammates were great and we won. Nash takes him off the dribble, wrap around the Mesmerizing force on the handle, Nash behind the back. When we look back on your career, the MVPs, of course, stick out. There's so much conversation around who should be an MVP. What, what should we give the award for? Is it for the best player in the league overall? Is it for who happened to have the best statistical season that year? How does your experience and some of the backlash against you when you won it over Kobe Bryant inform how you feel about it for today? That's a good question. You know, it's not really... I don't know that I have an opinion. You know, I, I think that, you know, it, it's a moment in time. And I think when we look back, we forget what that moment was and we just look at the names. And so you, you look back and you think, well, why hasn't LeBron won it every year? But in each individual year, we had some of the incredible seasons that, you know, that guys like Steph Curry or Kevin Durant, you know, were, were in that moment off the charts and it was their time. So I just, you know, look back at my career and I find a lot of reward that I put myself into that category and that conversation being a kid that uh, came from the west coast of Canada had one scholarship offer and nobody wanted and um, and scrapped and clawed and found my way to play 18 years in the league and, and have some success. There's no one who's a real comp to you in the NBA there's no present day Steve Nash but we've heard Mark Cuban compare his young star Luka Doncic to you a few times partly on the court, but also just in terms of position. He said letting you go was the biggest mistake he ever made. He's not going to make that mistake with Luca. as you prepare to face the Mavericks here on ABC Saturday night. What do you think of all of those comparisons? Well, it's a compliment for me. I mean, the, these guys today are unbelievable uh, basketball players. I mean, Luca can do all the things I could do, and he's 6'8", 235 pounds. So, you know, I'm... <laughs> Barely 6'2 and 178 pounds. I think it's gonna be a great game. You know, they, uh, they're a team that hasn't, hasn't reached their, their heights yet. And if we wanna beat them, we're gonna have to play near our best. All right, thanks to Steve and Rachel for that. This just in, according to the Nets, Kevin Durant will sit out through the All-Star break with that hamstring injury. So, Richard, you cover this team. How do you feel about this? I think it's, the, it's, it's easily the right move for a number of reasons. One, the team is playing well. Right, not that you're concerned about um, you're not that you're concerned about where you are in the standings or this, but the team is playing well. Kevin Durant obviously coming off an Achilles injury. If he has anything lingering, it's just like, dude, sit out for two weeks. Your goals are to win a championship. You need to be a hundred percent healthy. So the team's playing well. Take the break. You'll be fine.
Yeah, I'm with I'm with RJ on this one, George. Finally, right? I mean, <laughs> who needs Kevin Durant? The chemistry is great without him. Why come back and mess up the chemistry? But now, nah, seriously, Kevin Durant, it's about the marathon and not the it's not about the sprint. It's about the marathon, and I think he should take his time coming back. You know, like Richard said, coming off the Achilles injury. Because one thing about KD, he could fit in. He's going to fit in regardless. He's a guy that could play off the ball, uh, fish and score. You could move him around multiple positions. So I'm not worried about him coming back in and fitting in with this team. So I think it's the right decision. So, Perk, you started to allude to some of that, but give us some reasons as to why he would fit in so seamless, and it's probably more important for Kyrie and Harden to get on the same page. Well, I mean, because it's just who he is. When you look at him and, and you watch him in Golden State, I always was wondering – how was he going to fit in with Clay and Steph? And he did just that, averaging about, what, 25, 26 points a night on 18 shots. That's how good he is. Like, Kevin Durant is just an unselfish guy that it's all about team that can just come in and fit in whatever. He's just a flat-out hooper, though, George. You could drop him off anywhere in America. Richard, you yeah. can drop him off uh -huh. anywhere in America except where Perk is right now. No, that's yeah, Perk. Anywhere, He's back. Uh, yeah. No, no, we don't. We're done listening to Perk. Listen, <laughs> Kevin Durant is is just such an anomaly. It's, it's like you look at Chris Paul. Wherever Chris Paul goes, he has this positive impact on different teams. LeBron James, second year, you know, in Cleveland wins a championship. Second year in Miami wins a championship. Second, there are certain players that just understand the game of basketball and how it should be played. And Kevin Durant is one of those guys. He knows who he is. He knows his role. He knows what he does best, and he does it extremely well so get him a hundred percent healthy we've seen too many double surgeries you saw it with john wall you saw it with demarcus cousin a torn achilles a torn as you saw it with clay thompson a torn achilles a torn acl so sit him down till he's a hundred percent healthy george rj just said the same thing i said the only the only difference was i said it in Beaumont, Texas style, <laughs> and he said it from a graduate I, from Arizona. I, I, That's all. He I'm with you. To give it, he just wanted to give it out there the collegiate way. But I'm, <laughs> I gave it to you real in 100. I, I'm with you, Perk. You are 100. Richard, you're like, you know, 97 sometimes. All right, uh, whatever. That's yeah, fine. Yeah. All right. So let me ask you this. <laughs> Woj is just reporting that Demondis Sabonis will be the replacement for Kevin Durant. Um, so, Perk, let me ask you. We'll start with you. He's a big man, gets in the game. How do you feel about Sabonis in the game? I love it. Look, I thought he should have been in the All-Star game anyway over Vucevic, but that's neither here nor there. I love that Sabonis got, is the replacement. This guy is averaging 21 points, almost 12 rebounds, and five assists. And to me, he reminds me of a baby Jokic. He brings the same thing to the Pacers that Jokic brings to the Denver Nuggets. The offense is ran through him. He's skilled, one of the best passing bigs in the game today. And I love that he got his just due by being the replacement and going down the All-Star in Atlanta. You know what I don't know? Who replacements in the All-Star game were five years ago. So it doesn't matter that you're a, a replacement. You are an All-Star, Sabonis. That is all that matters. Congratulations. You deserve it. And I'm happy for you and your team, man. Congratulations. I love that Perk was about to disagree with you there and then realized that you were actually <laughs> saying the right thing there. All right. Coming up next, Dennis Schroeder is listed as probable for the Lakers game tonight after missing four games due to COVID protocols. What difference does his looming return? Lakers lost all four games they didn't play. So, Perk, what changes would Schroeder back in the lineup for the Lakers? Oh, everything changes. Let me tell you something, George. The Lakers need Dennis Schroeder like old people need soft shoes with orthotics in it, okay? We already know what he provides on the offensive end. Another facilitator, a guy that can, can create for others and can, can create for himself. But when on the defensive side of things, have you noticed since Dennis Schroeder has been out that the Lakers defense has taken a step back because he brings a tenacity to that team. He plays an old school game. He's a pest. He's still one of the few guys that picks up 94 feet. And when you're on that back line, especially a guy like myself, that was a center. When you used to see your point guard picking up full court and pressing guys, that brought the energy into you and made you want to get into guys and put life into you on the defensive end. So the Lakers getting Dennis Schroeder back is everything. RJ, you can fix your face like you want, but you know I'm <laughs> preaching the gospel right now, and it's just real, okay? 
Go ahead. Okay, so look, Perk is 100% right. Look, that when both him and Anthony Davis went out, you lost the front line of your defense, a guy that, like Perk said, picks up 94 feet. And he's not like this shutdown stopper, but he puts pressure on teams. From the beginning, from the minute you inbound the ball, he puts the pressure on you. And then you lose the guy that's the back line of your defense, blocking shots. The Lakers were a top three defensive team, and then these two guys went out. And low-key, their defense and their offense kind of went to shambles because both of these guys are great. Or, or Anthony Davis is great. Schroeder's a very good def uh, offensive player. So he is very important to the success of this team. At least the front line uh, of your defense will be back, and these guys can be aggressive. So having him back, all the problems aren't fixed because the Lakers had some glaring problems over this stretch, but it is a step in the right direction. All right, I can't add any more to that, but I'm with Perk. Old people do need soft shoes, RJ. What are you shaking your head about? Come on now. All right. Because he's going to keep coming up with random analogies, <laughs> and I'm just going to keep rolling my eyes. <laughs> All right. I'm just mad because you can't come up with it. Exit for what's going on in Boston right now. Well, it's, it's Brad Stevens because his lack of accountability. The Celtics have been inconsistent on the offensive end, and the defensive end. And when you start to see your role players do things out of body on the offensive end, like Tristan Thompson, who's my brother, I love to death, but catching it at the free throw line and trying to go between his legs and do hesitations to take guys off the dribble, that means that he's not being held accountable and being a star in his role. Watching Daniel Tice walk in the three-point shots early in the shot clock is just not going to get it. Watching Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown not put forth the effort defensively and fight like the rest of their teammates, that means that they got to say so and that they're not hearing or, or not being told what to do or how to do it. So it's on Brad Stevens. Perk not being told. Perk not being told. that I feel like that's a little bit of a stretch there. Ultimately, the Boston Celtics, they need to figure this out. I think they will. That's part of the growth for these two young stars that they have, these two young all-stars. Like, they need to look at within themselves. They need to look at their teammates. And there needs to be a higher level of accountability, not just from the coaching staff on down. Because, Perk, you know, coaching staff on down, that's to a level. It's amongst yourselves as players. You are now, you have two all-stars. You are no longer young in this league. You got your extensions. You got all the points and everything. So raise your accountability. How much are you yeah, going to challenge your teammates if you're those two stars? Well, let, uh, let me jump in real quick because I disagree with both of you. I think it's Danny Ainge who's said that this roster is not good enough and oh. it's it's on him okay oh, listen on, it's, it's not on brad stevens that kemba's knee is not great and that he hasn't played well it's also not on brad stevens that this team has not been deep even last year when they got to the conference finals that was remember, a and wait wait really quick remember when michael jordan said at his hall of fame speech players win championships he never saw he never saw a, a, a franchise or organization out there with a sprained ankle or playing with the flu the two players the two stars need to come together and they need to hold more of their teammates accountable including yeah, but, themselves but but, RJ, let me tell you something. Just like you work and cover the Brooklyn Nets, I work and cover the Boston Celtics. I watch every single game, and I'm telling you what these two, what my two eyes see <laughs> on a night-to-night -night basis. They are not being held accountable. They do whatever the hell they want to do when they want to do it. So when I'm telling you something and it's virtual learning right now, you need to listen. All right, at the buzzer here, Tim Bontemps tweets the Raptors, Say six members of the coaching staff, including head coach Nick Nurse, will not be on the bench due to COVID protocols and NBA health and safety guidelines. Perk, Kyle Lowry going to have to hold the clipboard tonight or what? I, uh, yeah, hey, look, he can finally get his chance to audition so when he retire, they can see what he made of. Call your own fouls, too.